Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, if you're new, I just want to welcome you to University Covenant Church. My name is John Fanus. I'm the lead pastor here, and we are just so glad to be together. I'm going to read from Daniel chapter 4. We're going to just read a portion of it, verses 19 on. Excuse me, 19 through uh, 27. Daniel 4, 19 through 27. Just some background as we get into this. Uh, we're in the fourth chapter, obviously, of Daniel. We'll be going through this series. And this, this, uh, this chapter starts with Nebuchadnezzar actually writing a letter to the readers. It's in the form of a letter. And he's sharing of a dream he had. He had yet another dream that disturbed him. He remembers this one, but he doesn't know the interpretation. So he calls all his wise counselors together to interpret the dream. They cannot so he calls Daniel, his trusted servant, one who's interpreted dreams for him before, and says, here's my dream, Daniel, interpret it. And we're going to read what happens right after this. From, uh, again, Daniel chapter 4, verse 19. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time. That word perplexed means appalled or even frightened. For his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. In other words, tell me. What's the interpretation? Don't be afraid. Belteshazzar, talking about Daniel, answered, My Lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, so he's going to describe the dream, which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals and having, a nest, and having nesting places, and its branches for the birds. Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky. And your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it. But leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field, while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, your majesty. And this is the decree. The Most High, referring to God, has issued against my Lord, the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. Later on, apparently the king either forgets this dream and interpretation or, or uh, ignores it, but he uh, is looking in his kingdom and he realizes that his kingdom is great and he tells himself, Nebuchadnezzar, you are awesome. At that point, the dream comes true. Nebuchadnezzar loses his mind, uh, loses his authority. He goes through some type of uh, psychological crisis. The Bible says he went through this for seven time periods. We don't know if that's seven years, seven months, seven seasons. We don't know. But for a season, he was in this. And at some point in that crisis, he looks up to heaven and realizes that God is in charge. At that point, God restores his sanity. And Nebuchadnezzar ends this chapter saying that the God of Daniel... The God who he ridiculed, the God who he made fun of, the God who he diminished is now his God. And he gives his life to his God. Now, I want you to catch the significance of this. And uh, um, I want to, you know, I share with first service, this is going to be a heavy sermon. You guys ready for some heavy lifting? <laughs> and when I mean heavy, we're going to read some dark things in scripture, some heavy things, some even, actually I'll just call it out, disturbing things. Because when we recognize what Nebuchadnezzar's history is and what he did, I hope you're going to begin to see, um, and I'll just use this word, how evil a person he is. He did some pretty disturbing things, and it makes Daniel's interactions with him all the more amazing. 
And I just have this heart for our church in this season. Um, you know, we are uh, a politically divided country. Uh, if you're on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, it's a little chaotic, uh, especially when it gets into politics. Um, it's just a tough season. And I felt like I just want to minister to our church during this season a little bit. Um, how many of you are aware of suffering in our country and world right now? Just raise your hands. You're aware of suffering. Okay, good. You're on the news. How many of you sometimes feel the suffering right now? Now, how many of you feel like the suffering even feels personal to you right now? Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's suffering. And so, how do we deal with this? Um, my parents immigrated from Egypt into the U.S. in 1969, and they'll share stories of the suffering they experienced and the fear they had for their kids growing up based on their experience. And I've had some experiences growing up that had some suffering. And there are times in that suffering where you just don't feel like you have a voice. I mean, have you been around a situation where you see bad things happening, but you feel powerless? Like, what do I do? Can I do anything? Well, we've been talking about the whole idea of having a faith that's on the fringes and how are we good news? Um, those on the slides, I'm going to skip a few slides here. Uh, but I want to just describe some of the suffering that those who lived in Jerusalem experienced during this season. I want you to get the... Um, the pain they experienced. And some of the verses I, I'm going to put up here are so disturbing. I'm not going to even read them aloud. I'm just going to have you read them to yourself uh, just to protect some of our little kids here. But the story of this, this is what Nebuchadnezzar did. So um, the, the country of Israel, is particularly around Jerusalem, they had this goal from God that they would be blessed by him so they could be a blessing. This country had a purpose. And, and as the years progressed, more and more they strayed away from that purpose. And so God sent prophets to warn them, saying, change your ways. If you don't change your ways, Jerusalem, punishment and consequence will come upon you. And so for decades, God would send people who, out of love, would warn them. But that warning kept going unheeded and unheeded until, over a slow process, Babylon began to take over the country of Israel, and particularly the city of Jerusalem. And, and so Daniel was one of these people who was exiled from Jerusalem and had to serve in, ba in, in Babylon in the year 605 BC. Well, around 16 or so years later, while Daniel was in Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, through a variety of uh, situations, decided to bring his destruction against Jerusalem to finality. There was a king he put in place, um, uh, uh, I want to call him Zebediah, but that's not quite it. We'll, we'll see his name when we uh, look at these verses, who at first was listening to King Babylon, but then he staged an insurrection. So that prompted Babylon and his people to go and conquer the city of Jerusalem. And he was very strategic. Uh, the way things were done back then is uh, cities were surrounded by walls for protection. And so if you really want to uh, defeat a city, what you would do is you would surround the city with your army and allow nothing to leave or nothing to come in. And one of the things you would purposely not allow to come into a city when you had it under siege was food. Because what would happen if no food can come to a city? You starve. Yeah. So this siege lasts anywhere from 18 to 30 months. We think on average about two years it lasted. So just imagine for a moment that there was no way for your Safeways or your food stores or your grocery stores to get any food in the city of Davis or Woodland or wherever you're from for two years. And you can't drive because for some reason someone figured out how to block out all the exits. Two years. It caused great, great suffering. People were dying. Kids often were dying first because they were little. And Nebuchadnezzar organized a strategic thing. He did four different things to destroy this city. I'm going to go through each four, just so you understand the heaviness and the evilness of what happened. Here's the first. We're going to skip some slides, slide people. He had forced famine. I'm not going to read this verse. This is from Lamentations 4.10. But just read it to yourself at what happened when kids died in the city of Jerusalem. The book of Lamentations was written after Babylon took over, and it's the Jewish people lamenting what happened to them. And so they begin to write down some of the atrocities that happened. Imagine someone did this to you and to your children and got you to such a point of desperation that you had to do this. That king that King Nebuchadnezzar put in place who rebelled, this is what he did to that king. Let's go to the next thing. Murder and torture. Again, I won't read this one aloud. Just read it to yourself. Zedekiah is the king I was talking about. Um, some of you have kids. I have two boys. I think Zedekiah had two sons as well. And just imagine for a moment that 
you saw this happen, and then it was the last thing you saw. It was the kind of evilness that King Nebuchadnezzar did. And then if you remember, if you know your, your Bible history, um, one of the areas where that was the center of Jewish life was the temple. That King David wanted to build the temple hundreds of years earlier. God said no, but his son King Solomon built this temple. and It, was, it had the Holy of Holies and where God's presence was. People would come to worship God. This was the center of God's presence. This is what King Nebuchadnezzar did to the temple and all the surrounding buildings. Let's go to the next one. Destruction, I can read this one aloud from 2 Kings chapter 25. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. So not only did he cause destruction and famine to the people that they were so desperate, not only did he make a public ridicule of the king that was there and torture and murder his kids, he also destroyed the buildings that were most precious that represented the faith life of this community. You can imagine the horror of seeing that central symbol torn down. And the last thing he did is he forced some uh, forced displacement. He took the cream of the crop from Israel and brought them to Babylon. Second Kings 25 says, The commander of the guard carried into exile the people who remained in that city, along with the rest of the populace and those who had been deserted to the king of Babylon. So the king of Babylon strategically took everyone, exiled all of them to Babylon, made them his servants, except for the poorest of the poor. They got to stay in Jerusalem because he knew they would do no harm. And so for, uh, for about 70, 80 years, the city of Jerusalem was just dissolute, uh, without much leadership, and was really in despair. This is heavy, but I want you to understand the kind of leader Nebuchadnezzar was. Are you with me? It's heavy stuff. And so the reason I share this is... Um, the people of Israel at this time were experiencing deep, deep suffering. Deep suffering. And we're in a world, and this will not change until Jesus comes, that will experience deep, deep suffering. It will come in different forms. It will come through different events. It will come through natural disasters. It will come through political leaders. It will come through war. It will come through famine. But we live in a world that's really broken. So the big question is, when you're in this kind of suffering... Here's the question. What do you do? What do you do? What we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at several different responses, two in particular, but two different responses uh, that took place. One is from a person who wrote a psalm, and the other is Daniel himself. And we're going to find that there wasn't a unified response to suffering. There wasn't a unified response to oppression. But there are multiple responses. And a lot of it has to do with our position in society, what we have access to and what we don't. But what I want for us is that we would gain some tools and understand God's heart when it comes to suffering. And I know for some of us, the suffering is real right now. It could be suffering you're feeling on a personal end. It could be suffering you're feeling on a political end. Uh, one of our friends just shared something going on uh, in another country that's just totally painful right now, but it's affecting his family. So for some of you, the suffering isn't personal. It's just you're seeing friends suffer. But in, in all of us, it's what do we do in the midst of suffering and what do we learn from Daniel? There are times in the suffering where we're not in charge of it. We feel powerless. There was someone or a group of people who are in charge of the suffering. And we wish we had the power to do something, but there's nothing we can do. And yet we see the suffering affect either our ambitions or the ambitions of those we love. We see it affect the hopes for the future for some. Sometimes the suffering really degrades at our sense of self-worth and how we view ourselves. Can you imagine the Israelites seeing all this happen? What the message was about how, how little value they had. Sometimes the suffering you see it happening not to you, but to those you care about. You wonder, what can I do? But what do you do when you're seeing suffering, but you're not the one in power to make it change? What do you do when you experience suffering, but you're not the one who has the reins on making things change to alleviate, alleviate it? These are questions that are happening now, but there will be qu questions that are going to come up again in different generations as well. And what I want us to do is look at these responses from the Israelites and see, is there a place for us in the midst of that? Make sense what we're doing? Okay. So, there are some of us who experience suffering, and for whatever reason, maybe our position in society or our location, we have no power to do anything about it. 
This was the situation of the person who wrote Psalm 137. I want you to watch. I don't know if it was a, a man or a woman. I want you to watch what the psalmist wrote. Because it's a prayer. It's a song that this person wrote. And as we read this prayer, we're going to get uh, insights on how we can approach God and how he can take on our suffering. Let's take a look. Psalm 137 says this. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. When we remembered Zion. Zion's another name for the hill that the temple was on. So here we have some exiles, people who used to be in Jerusalem, and now were taken, and now they're sitting in a foreign country that's not their own, and they're sitting by the rivers of this foreign country, and they are sitting together, and they are crying because they remember their hometown, remember the temple, and remember what's happened to them. It says, there on the poplars, we hung our harps. We hung our harps on trees. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. I want you to catch what's happening. The Babylonians are taking those people who are suffering, who've been exiled, who've seen their temple destroyed, who've seen their families slaughtered, and they're saying, hey, ha, 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 look at us, look at you. Why don't you sing some of your old songs about how good Jerusalem is and how wonderful your temple is? Go ahead. This is going to be great. Sing some of those songs you wrote. So the psalm is saying, how can I sing those songs? They're tormenting us. They're making fun of us. There's a sense of grief. He goes on. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. This is a prayer. Please, God, help me not forget where I come from. And how can I sing songs of joy? goes on and says this. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. The Edomites helped the Babylonians conquer Jerusalem. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundation. Remember, God, what they did. And then he, the psalmist speaks to Babylon, the country that this person is now sitting in. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. And a disturbing prayer. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. And this is how the psalm ends. No resolution. No, just kidding, God. <laughs> just joking. Had a tougher moment there. And this made it into our word, the word of God. And I want to just say that when you are experiencing suffering and you feel like you have no voice, or you're seeing the suffering of others and wish you can do something and you can have no voice, I want, you know, the Bible models that we can have prayers of agony to God. We can share our deepest pains. We can pray unholy prayers that seem so non-godly because God can handle it. And this is not just pain that's Worldwide, this could be pain you're feeling personally. Because behind pain, there's this thing of God, could someone hear my story? God, can someone feel my pain with me? And when we pray those kinds of prayers, God says, Yes, I feel your pain with you. I am a God of the suffering. And so many times, brothers and sisters, that when we're experiencing great agony, we tend to go away from God because we see God as the, the author of that suffering. And God says, no, 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 no. In the midst of your suffering, come to me. If there are areas where you feel you have no power, you have no place to do anything to make change, and here are some people who are sitting in Babylon, we don't know who they are. We just know they can do nothing about their situation. But God has given them room to pray, to cry, to feel pain, and to even express wishes of torment on their oppressors, even if those are the wrong prayers to pray. God said, I would rather you pray on his prayers right now. What's really going on for you? Do we have a chance to pray? And I, I just want to encourage us, church, that we belittle prayer sometimes. We think it's a cop-out or it's something we do when we don't want to take action. But we believe that God is at work to alleviate suffering right now, whether or not we pray. And our prayers are entering in that suffering with him and opening up our heart to him, to be able to hear from him and let him speak to us in the midst of these prayers so that he transforms our hearts. 
Some of the times that God will most speak to you, his perspective and give you a bigger picture of what he's doing is when you pray honest prayers and you stop and listen and say, God, what do you want to say to me? And God will speak into these prayers. So don't belittle prayer. Prayer is powerful. For ways we don't understand, prayer changes things. That God, as he alleviates suffering and and pursues justice, he calls us to enter into that with our prayers. This is one way that people have responded to suffering. is to push into God with honest prayers and express our agony. And it's a tool for us as well. Now Daniel was a little different. Daniel's response was different. I don't know who the psalmist was, but Daniel was given a position within Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom and it became a position of influence. And you would think, certainly Daniel... As you are in this position, you would speak up and tell Nebuchadnezzar how evil he is, how wrong he is, how much suffering he's caused to his people. But strangely, and maybe disturbingly, as you read what Nebuchadnezzar did to his people, you might wonder, why did Nebuchadnezzar never, sorry, why did Daniel never speak up to Nebuchadnezzar? He had the king's ear. He perhaps could have influenced the king to make more righteous decisions, to, to alleviate suffering. But for some reason that we don't really know, Daniel chose not to say anything. Daniel's chapter 1, 2, and 3. We don't know how long that time period was. But in Daniel chapter 4, Daniel does speak up for the first time. He tells Nebuchadnezzar that maybe now is the time to repent of his sin and to stop oppressing the poor. But what I want to argue is for some reason in this situation, Nebuchadnezzar listened or eventually listened to Daniel or before I'm not sure Daniel would have had a voice with King Nebuchadnezzar. Here's the story again. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and this dream is a dream about God's punishment on Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that says, and he tells Daniel and Daniel interprets it and this dream says, God is finally going to bring punishment for the ways you've caused suffering. Because you think you're greater than you are and God wants you to have humility that he's given you this power but not to abuse but to steward. You are serving the God most high. Nebuchadnezzar, you need some humility and God is going to teach you that he is king and you are not. But what's disturbing and what's surprising about Daniel chapter 4 is how Daniel speaks of King Nebuchadnezzar's impending judgment. And maybe you caught it, maybe you didn't, but let's take a look at what he says. In Daniel 4, 19, Belshazzar, Daniel answered, My Lord, if only the dream applied to who? Your enemies. And it's meaning to your adversaries. Wait a minute, hold on, my brain hurts. You would think, Daniel would say, Finally! After all the wrongdoing you've done to my people, finally, I get to tell you about a dream of what God's going to do to you. Yes. But Daniel has this strange attitude of, I just, I know that God is going to bring judgment on you. And I hope that this, or wish that this dream could apply to other people and not you. Where is that coming from? See, Daniel had some weird thing where he actually cared for Nebuchadnezzar. Go figure. He actually cared for the one who was causing oppression. He actually cared for the one who was causing suffering. He actually cared for the one whose stories he would hear from family members about what the oppression did to their families. He says, oh, if only it didn't apply to you and apply to your adversaries. And then Daniel interprets the dream for him and then at the end of the interpretation, he gives Nebuchadnezzar advice. He says this, Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. He's like, now's the time for you to change. But look at the motivation that Daniel has towards Nebuchadnezzar. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. So even in this, Daniel's saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you've got to repent. Why? Because I do want you to prosper. I do want you to do well. There are times 
where you see suffering around you, and it's either those you care about or those towards you, and there's nothing you can do. You have no influence, and all you can do is pray. But there are times by praying to God that then at some point that you're not expecting, he will open up a door or a window for you to do something to alleviate, power, to alleviate suffering. He will give you a, a realm of influence where you can speak up and make a difference. And Daniel found this moment that at this point, for some reason and not early, he felt like this is the chance where I can speak up and give Nebuchadnezzar advice and an admonition to repent of his sins and to pursue justice. But I want you to catch that Daniel's heart was actually for Nebuchadnezzar. You guys catch that? He actually cared about him. Daniel didn't shy away for asking for what was right when the opportunity came. But he did it out of a sincere love for the one who was oppressing his people. And I think this is good for us, brothers and sisters, as we think about our own suffering or the suffering of others when we have no power, or we feel like we have no power. That our heart towards the one causing suffering needs to be modeled after the heart Jesus has for us. That he actually loves us even when we do him harm. And the purpose in Daniel's mind was to transform his enemy, not to destroy him. The purpose for Daniel was the transformation of his enemy, not his destruction. And this idea of actually caring for the enemy, caring for the one causing harm, caring for the one making my life miserable, caring for the one that makes the lives of others miserable is such a difficult message because it could look like we don't care about oppression. It could look like we don't care about suffering. In fact, I am sure there are some people like the person who wrote Psalm 137 who would look at Daniel and say, traitor, you're not doing anything. You actually care about this guy? Step it up. We don't know the background, what was going on in Daniel's heart, but we know that God was doing something transforming in Daniel, where Daniel cared for his people, he cared for his oppression, uh, uh, the oppression, but he also cared for the one who was causing the suffering too, and wanted his best as well. And I just want to say this, the whole idea of loving your enemy and wanting the best for them is uniquely what it means to be a Christian. The purpose for our enemies is not to see them destroyed, but to see them transformed. And hundreds of years later, Jesus would model this for us, and he would teach this. And he was teaching to a group of Israelites, people, Jewish people, who are now under Roman occupation. Different time zone, same issue. We're under oppression. And then Jesus taught them this. He said this, You have heard it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun, his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? In other words, if you love those who are only kind and think highly of you, welcome to the human race. That's not unique. He says, aren't even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Peter, later on, would write the same thing to the people he was writing to. 1 Peter 3.9 says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so you may inherit a blessing. So this is a unique calling as a follower of Jesus. That you care for the suffering and that when you have an opportunity to speak up for those who are oppressed and suffering, you use that influence because God is a God of the oppressed. And you care for the oppressor, the one causing the suffering. And you pray for them too. And you want the best for them as well. Wow! That's so unique. It's so different and so radical and so disturbing. And yet, that's what Jesus did for you and me. 
Isaiah 53 says it was our sins that went on Jesus, that we were the ones that caused his oppression, that we, you and I, because of our actions, put him on the cross. That was our doing. You can't point fingers there. And yet Jesus chose to love us and forgive us and use his death on the cross to transform us. And he says, you've got to love the oppressed. You've got to use your voice and your influence to stand up for the oppressed. And you need to protect your heart so you love the oppressor too. Because God's gospel is for the oppressed and the oppressor. That all of us are included in that. Amen? Amen. So we take our anger to God.